represents the journey from industry 4.0 to society 5.0, implications for business and society. We start this session with our humble regards to Mr. 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 S.K. Birla, President of Shikshayat and Foundation, Board of Governors, Honorable Trustees, and whole committee members of CBA. Special mention must be made of Mr. Gautapi Bhattacharya, Secretary General and CEO of Shikshayatan Foundation, and Mr. Sora Ghosh, Senior Advisor, Shikshayatan Foundation, and Dr. Pinaki Ranjan Bhattacharya, Principal of Calcutta Business School. Our panelists for today are Dr. Justin Paul, Editor-in-Chief, International Journal of Consumer Studies, University of Reading, Henley Business School, England and University of Puerto Rico, San Juan, USA. And Dr. Rui Chunkar Mukherjee, Principal Education, Training and Assessment, Infosys. Also joining this meet today are the faculty members and students of Calcutta Business School. This event is being live streamed on Facebook for our viewers. Calcutta Business School is a residential institute keeping in mind the need for management education in Eastern India and being an autonomous institution, it offers AITT approved PGDM courses designed as per the latest industry needs by an expert team, faculty and advisors comprising of both renowned academicians and industry leaders and has recently introduced a BBA in business analytics course in collaboration with Macau. And representing Calcutta Business School today as moderator is Professor Sanjeev Biswa. Assistant Professor, Calcutta Business School. Professor Sanjeev Biswa has a working experience of 18 years in industry and academia. He has published and presented more than 40 research articles in reputed national and international journals. Madam, uh, Madam, please short my profile because I'm feeling a little bit embarrassed in front of two of, uh, I mean, stalwarts in their field. So <clears throat> it is good enough for me. I'm a teacher of this college and I'm the moderator of this session. Sure, sir. Okay, as you wish. So, uh, sir, main areas are uh, multi-criteria decision-making models and their applications in managerial decision-making, mm -hmm. multivariate analysis, logistics and supply chain management, sustainability, fuzzy logic and machine learning. And may I add that, sir, also takes a keen interest in Bengali poetry, which we are uh, we enjoy sometimes. So I request you to take, please take the session forward. Thank you so much, ma'am. Actually, today I'm feeling uh, very much honored to share the session with two st stalwarts or experts, one from industry and one from academia. Before I start about their introduction, it's my privilege to introduce our honorable speakers for this session. I must express that my sincere thanks to Professor Paul, because whatever little bit of research I'm doing right now, I owe a lot to him because way back in 2018, I got one of my paper submitted to International Journal of Emerging Markets, got rejected and uh, one professor was the reviewer and he gave such an useful comments and that professor is none other than Professor Justin Paul. Actually, his comments has changed my entire perspectives about research. I started uh, thinking about writing, how to write the papers, how to uh, present the problem. And from that point onwards, I started reading his masterpieces. And I came to know many things from him. And it is my fortune to share the session with Professor Paul. Dr. Justin Paul currently serves as an Editor-in-Chief of International Journal of Consumer Studies, a 45-year-old global academic journal ranked as ABDCA. A former faculty member of University of Washington, he is a full professor of PhD and MBA programs, University of Puerto Rico, US, visiting professor, University of Reading, Henley Business School, England. He holds two honorary titles as Distinguished Scholar or Professor of Indian Institute of Management, I am Koji Code, and SIBM, a premier B school in South Asia. He is very famous as an author or co author of books such as Business Environment, International Marketing, Services Marketing, Export and Import Management, Management of Banking and Financial Services, <coughs> published by 
reputed publishers like McLaughlin, Oxford University Press, and Pearson, respectively. All of his books are bestsellers. Dr. Paul has served as a lead guest editor with the International Business Review, Journal of Business Research, Journal of Retailing and Consumer Services, Asia Pacific Business Review, and European Business Review. All are ranked very high in ABDC list and high, having high impact factor. He serves as an associate editor of European Management Journal, Journal of Strategic Marketing. He has also edited special issues of numerous journals, such as Small Business Economics, Journal of Promotion Management, to name a few. As I said, he was the senior or associate editor for the International Journal of Emerging Markets, the Services Industry Journal, European Journal of International Management for three years. Dr. Paul is very famously known for his contribution in academics in form of proposing a completely new dimension in the area of marketing management in form of a new theory in consumer behavior, such as Mastige model. Those who do not know about this model, it is basically mass plus prestige. This call it as a Mastige model and measure for brand management, CPP model for internationalization, scope framework for small firms, 7P framework for international marketing. He is the most highly cited, among the highly cited researchers whose articles have been downloaded over eight lakhs times during the last six years. He has published 130 research papers in SCI index journals and 150 in Scopus index journal. Out of these, over 70 papers are in A or A star category journal of ABDC. In addition, he has taught full courses at Aarhus University, Denmark, Grenoble Eco Lede Management, University of France, University in France, University in Lithuania, University of Warsaw, Poland, and has conducted numerous number of research development workshops in countries like Austria, US, Spain, Croatia, and China. He has visited a numerous number of countries like USA, UK, Canada, France, Germany. I mean, the list is enormously long. So it is my honor to introduce Dr. Justin Paul in front of you. Our another speaker of this panel discussion is another uh, stalwart in the industry, Dr. Hodi Shankar Mukherjee. Dr. Hodi Shankar Mukherjee is a result-oriented, distinguished professional with 18 plus years of experience across industries, functions, and roles. He is currently employed as principal education, training, and assessment at Infosys Limited where he is responsible for learning and development of 14,000 plus SAP consultants. An author of three books, 15 articles in UGC, Scopus, ABDC listed journals, nine conference papers, and more than 20 MDP, FDPs, and one consulting assignment. Besides that, he takes active interest in academics, and he is the reviewer in the reviewer board of premier journals listed in ABDC and Scopus. He is a columnist at the Pioneer, the New Indian Press, Express. He has served as an invited speaker, co-chair, panelist for multiple international conferences. He is a PhD in customer relationship management from Gitam University, MA in economics from Annamala University in 2007, and PGDM from Symbiosis Institute of Management Studies. So without any delay, it is my fortune and privilege to introduce both the speakers Today, we are going to listen from them about their views on a very contemporary and relevant issues today. Today, we will be talking the journey from Industry 4.0, which we are experiencing, and the, to Society 5.0, which, to which we are going to, and the key implications for business and society. Indeed, we are in the age of in a technology-centric operations, technology-centric society. But the question lies that how we are poised, what are the benefits of technology for technology 4.0 or industry 4.0, so to say, for the business and industry. And now, as we are moving to our society 5.0, that talks about human-centric technology or a integration of cyber physical space to the social space. So in that, during this transition, what what are the changing nature of businesses? How does it affect the society? And in order to withstand the changes or embrace the changes of industry 4.0 and to move it towards the in society 5.0, 
what are the things that people should do or the young students like who are joining here, they should learn. And so these are the few things that in a nutshell, we would cover in this session. So before <clears throat> to start the <clears throat> proceedings, I would be asked, I'm curious to get answers to questions or two questions like, what will be the changes in business management in coming years and how technology will connect the dots like business and society and will be leveraged for achieving inclusive growth. So this is the two, these are the two questions that I'm very curious to listen to the experts. So first I would start with Professor Paul. Uh, sir, we are about to listen to your views on these two questions that what would be the changes in business management in coming years? Yeah, thank you for this invitation. And uh, it's an honor for me to share some of my thoughts as part of uh, this program today. And um, it's very interesting and it's very um, up-to-date uh, theme that uh, this uh, webinar is all about, uh, Society 5. And uh, we know that Society 4, Information Society and uh, um, we have moved from the primitive society to agricultural society, to industrial society, to information society. Society two was agriculture focused uh, agricultural society and society three was industrial society. And uh, society four um, is uh, considered to be the information society and society five is nothing but the society that integrates uh, information technology in all different ways that include artificial intelligence, that include big data, that include uh, all kind of the new developments that is embracing the, the world in different, uh, different ways and different permutations and combinations. And uh, uh, it's a very interesting situation that we are going through, especially in the pandemic context, if you think about in the COVID-19 context, if you think about uh, particularly uh, the impact of COVID-19 has uh, resulted into the increasing uh, focus or increasing, um, you know, emphasis given to the Society 4 and Society 5 trends. And because of, uh, you know, everybody has gone for online transactions these days and online uh, businesses have become very common. People are using uh, uh, all kind of technology these days, even mobile application. For example, I can tell you mobile apps. Who use mobile apps to order food delivery? I mean, order food from different shops. So last two years, almost all the restaurants, what they have done is, this is just an example. They, they were closed. We know that there was lockdown. There was uh, um, uh, half capacity-based operation rule social distancing, all this resulted into people not going to the restaurants. So hotels and restaurants were running empty. So what they did is that they immediately launched a mobile app. They launched a mobile app for their restaurants and they started promoting that. And, and many people started using mobile apps for ordering food, food delivery applications, mobile app uh, for food delivery. This is such a wonderful uh, phenomena because uh, people, uh, you know, don't need to cook. Uh, people uh, can don't need to go to restaurants. They can just order on their mobile app. They don't even need to think about having a uh, laptop. Sometimes, uh, you know, they may be coming from office to home and they can still use mobile app and those kind of things. So such kind of uh, new technologies are these days coming up. And uh, we know that uh, these technologies uh, will, will stay here. And these technologies, I'm not going to details of artificial intelligence and all those kind of things, but uh, uh, this is mobile app is just a classic example of how society is changing. And, and, and we have mobile apps for each and everything these days. We have mobile apps for almost everything that we can do with the mobile app. We, we started using mobile app for uh, mobile banking. Actually, I started, I remember uh, when I started using the mobile app first time, it was for mobile banking. And, and, and banks introduced mobile app before many other industries introduced mobile apps. And then, then we got diversified into mobile apps of different other sectors. So we use uh, many mobile apps these days. I don't know how many mobile apps you use, but the new generation use mobile apps uh, much more than 
uh, the old generation. So uh, generation, so what we call it as uh, uh, 18 to 30, they use uh, mobile apps daily basis for each and everything. So such kind of changes we have seen, and uh, we are going to see more and more changes which will have impact on society in different ways. Dr. Sanjeev, you are on mute. Professor Sanjeev, you are yes. on mute. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Yes. So thank you, sir, for uh, explaining the changes in business management in coming years with this example. Indeed, it's a classical example of the disruption that has happened in the marketplace. I will take to the same questions to Dr. Mukherjee that, sir, what do you think the changes are Man, uh, coming in coming uh, that would happen in coming years and how technology would be leveraged more and more for achieving inclusive growth okay thank you so sanjeev can you hear me yes your voice is a little bit low okay is it is it better now yes yes yeah okay so i'll hold this uh, closer to my mouth okay so a uh, couple of things sanjeev uh, and and for uh, the audience thank you thank you for inviting me uh, so, uh, Professor Justin has a long list. I, I uh, been being in the part of uh, industry as well as uh, uh, a part of academics as well. So, I I have also it's it's my privilege essentially to uh, speak with Professor Justin, uh, being a person who is from the marketing area. Uh, uh, it, it's impossible. It's highly impossible that you have probably not read Professor Justin, right? Uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Calcutta Business School, for organizing this and uh, giving it an opportunity to speak. So a couple of things coming back to the point. Uh, first of all, uh, let's try and understand. Uh, uh, Professor Justin has already spoken from the consumer perspective. He's a marketing guy. I understand that. So let me try and give a holistic picture about business and uh, how it runs. So technology has always been uh, at the core of any business today. Right, so customer is at the uh, at the center. Uh, no, no disrespect on that. But today, if you look at the infrastructures and systems that are in place, any any big large companies, so technology is at the heart of it, right? And uh, while technology is trying to make lives smoother for people, if you look at the Indian context, uh, the Indian railways booking, right, typically from the uh, booking style in the early 1980s and people kids would not have even seen that and today what you see today uh, as a final byproduct of that things have dramatically changed so professor justin was talking about online uh, delivery apps so technology is there essentially to make your life simple that's the first thing second thing is that with the impact of technology a lot of understanding into the consumer behavior in form of analytics on the fly analytics that is uh, you are analyzing the data of the customer uh, while the transaction is being made right so so that is essentially what is going to make this piece very very interesting right so uh, so uh, uh, you often hear that data is the new oil right and and uh, most of companies today are investing a large amount of their uh, funds into the data management right so it it was always there uh, so if you if you look at the 60s and 70s wherein mainframes had uh, had been brought in by the ibms uh, so today you look at the lightweight model of using technology so you have an app on your mobile phone and you go and do whatever you would want to do so service is now at your doorstep it was also there but today with the aid of technology correct so crm as a concept has been there for the last 200 years today is it is with the aid of technology it's 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 not it's it's not providing something new right so it has always been a backbone to businesses second is what impact is it making on the society in terms of essentially in terms of the businesses so if you look at the processes if you look at the people right there is a lot of changes that is happening let let me talk about the people first so today when you look at a uh, look at any organization lot of jobs are getting redundant today the jobs which were there there even 10 or 15 years back are no more there people are migrating slowly migrating into new and newer skills 
right? Handmade things were a big thing in the past. Automobile industry had a lot of workers, union, unionized workers. Today you see driverless cars being uh, being tested upon, although although it's still far away from reality, but you are seeing that. You will see metros in cities, right? You will see uh, the subways in the city in in cities essentially being run, or the tunnels in the cities being run by driverless uh, trains, right? So all of these are being tested into because the moment you have a machine interface, it make it makes the process even more efficient, right? So what you will see over a period of time is that a lot of these jobs will slowly and steadily becoming redundant. And the new generation has to gear themselves up to capture the essence of what is happening new in the market, right? The second thing all about technology is that when you look at the technology space, more and more companies are becoming lightweight. Previously, if you had to do a ERP implementation, even uh, SAP or a Oracle or any other kind of ERP or a Microsoft implementation in any of the Fortune 500 or 1000 companies, uh, you would effectively spend a year and a half designing the landscape, getting the things in place, getting, getting the data in order, and then finally giving it live to the customer and telling him, now it's ready for you to use. But today they are, they are, they are just not ready to wait for so long, right? Technologies are lighter. They want faster products. They want products which can be put in the form of a CD, right? Just play in, right? And take it out or, or a remote center wherein you can log in and the system is ready at the end of six months. So, so the life cycle of an IT project typically has come down and therefore the pressure on the people who are operating out of this industry or managing the technology or, or consultants like me or the set of engineers that are working around to make this technology work has tremendously increased. So the, so the way we have been working in the past vis-a-vis -vis the way we have been doing it now has tremendously changed. Couple of other things that has been, uh, that has been made relevant is personalization in business. So if you today look at any of the companies online uh, retail forums, for example, Amazon or for example, Flipkart, right? Our own Indian first e-commerce venture which was built in lines of Amazon, have uh, tremendously tried to personalize your uh, offering, right? And that this is, the, this is the way going forward. Probably you will be seeing more and more personalization coming in into the kind of uh, pitches, sales pitch that you are essentially doing to your customers and clients, right? So it is very difficult, Sanjeev, that uh, we are uh, trying to generalize in this one hour of discussion. We can go on and on essentially on the broad level of changes. But uh, these are some of the changes in terms of processes also. You will see certain processes getting redundant and more and more technology interfaces are coming in. Cryptos, for example, Bitcoins, for example, uh, blockchains, for example. So these are, these are things, artificial intelligence, machine learning, these are essentially making the older processes redundant and they are trying and bringing in new and new stream of thought, new and new ways of uh, making things or doing things better and easier for the people and the customer. Whatever it might be, it, it could be in the areas of uh, new energy, it could be in the areas of governance, it could be in the area of uh, high-tech equipment, it could be in the area of robotics, whatever it might be. So the job is, job what technology is trying to essentially do is essentially make your life simple. It, it was always there, right? But with additions like, uh, getting your data in place, trying to look at what the customer, predicting what the customer is essentially going to buy. Predictive analytics has been there for quite some time now, right? So now they are coming in with real-time analytics, right? So there are uh, there are a lot of systems and programs in place which are essentially doing this, correct? So most and most technology companies, the technology space is getting very heated up, very interesting. And uh, that is what you are going to see forward. And obviously all of these technological changes are making an impact on business, which Professor Justin has already spoken about, right? So uh, changes in terms of the way we operate, the changes in terms of the way uh, a customer is given service, changes in terms of the way interaction happens, right? Online, for example, like ATM, ATM machine, right? <clears throat> which is more of a self-service technology. So there's a lot of, research that has been done on the self service technology and in fact if you if you if you look at the adoption of self service technologies 
uh, which, uh, which has been spoken about for the last 20, 30 years. Uh, Self-service uh, technologies has is still way to catch up in the Indian markets, right? Uh, if you if you go to Japan, even you will find a egg dispensed on the retail machines. But in India, you still do not see that, right? You you still have your milk vendors and uh, the dairy milks that the, the the dairy products that you have, and some of the products which are vended with with self-service technologies, banks, for example, uses ATMs essentially to do that. Right, so uh, there is a way, way, uh, long, long way for us essentially to go ahead in the way we are uh, using technology, and we would be using technology to make our lives easier. For example, look at income tax filings that we have been doing. Right, it is, it has made our work much more simpler with the help of technology. Previously, we had to, when I started my job, we had to fill in the papers, the long, long papers we had to fill in, submit it, and then it used to come back. Today, everything is online. In, it, it, it is making uh, governance of, uh, of, of IT much more simpler. So, so technology essentially is pervasive across industries, working uh, throughout, uh, throughout your life from the, from the, from the right from the start of your day, and that is essentially what is going to, and, and obviously businesses are making that transformation. So wh whatever transformations uh, businesses are making, technology is trying to make a change, and similarly, if there is a change in technology, then businesses are trying to derive meaning out of that. So both of them are coexisting. Co so there is a synergy between technology and business. If technology is taking a step ahead, businesses are following suit, and if businesses are taking a step ahead, technology is keeping pace with it. So, so both of them are having a symbiotic relationship as of today, right? This is this is what I would uh, summarize it as. Thank you, sir, uh, for explaining these uh, holistic perspectives of the relationship between technology and, of course, business cycle. Where they actually form, indeed, they actually form a cycle where technology gets changed. So as the business, business generates the needs and that creates the, that acts like an enabler for the next change in the technology. So it all works hand by hand. And Dr. Mukherjee has touched upon very uh, important area called technology space, where the changes are happening in the product process. And vis-a-vis -vis these changes, the working style, the working process, the requirements, the skill set, those are also changing. He also touched about the concept called personification, which is, a, I believe, is the heart of society 5.0. And when we think of personification, it, uh, it comes towards a kind of psychology or behavior of the person who are using it. In other words, it has an impact on the consumer behavior. And when we talk about consumer behavior, I'm tempted to ask Dr. Paul that during your, uh, with you in your experience, what are the changes that you have seen in the consumer behavior over the last few years? And what are the changes you were expecting? Of course, one example we have given as a mobile app, but it is very day-to-day very, uh, -day common example and yet very disruptive uh, use of technology. But I am just tempted to ask you this question, sir, that what are the changes you have seen uh, in the consumer behavior in past five, six years and where we are heading to? Consumers are these days increasingly demanding and they, they need everything um, at the click of the mouse using laptop or uh, using a mobile app. But there's a difference between cohorts or generation of consumers, for example, I get on an average uh, 20, 25 messages on my WhatsApp, but I don't like that because I don't belong to that 20s generation. I don't belong to the new generation because 20, 25 messages on your phone every day, it is beyond your capacity and it is it is it disturb your schedule and time management. But I know that people in 20s or people in 30s, they love very much and they spend all the time looking at the phone and always with the WhatsApp and all those kind of things. But it, I don't think that uh, it, it, it is an efficient way of doing it, just for example, because it takes more time than making a telephone call. And uh, sometimes you make typo, sometimes you have to fix it if you send a reply and a lot of things like that. So sometimes technology has its own negative aspects also in such, such kind of situations where people waste their time 
sending so many messages and typing so many messages on small device like a phone. But, uh, uh, but on the other hand, technology has brought in a lot of uh, positive aspects or dimension, positive dimensions in many walks of life. Like these days you can use, uh, you know, we all started using computers and laptops with the mouse, but these days uh, we don't even have mouse, but we can use keyboards to do almost everything. So, you know, let's say uh, online transactions, online sales and online purchase. Five years ago, people were not buying uh, stuff or people were not buying products online. People were all happy to go to retail stores to buy everything. But these days, people buy, including their cloth things. Normally, when you buy cloth things, uh, shirts or pants, those kind of things, you're supposed to look at the measurement size and supposed to check and all those kind of things. But nowadays, people know their size. 34 is my, or 36 is my uh, size, or, you know, I mean, for my, my, my uh, uh, pants, uh, I need 36 uh, width uh, size pants, or I know that I need uh, this size uh, shirt or those kind of things. And I, I can just buy it online using Amazon or using any other, uh, you know, eBay or any other portals, or even books people can buy online. So these days, uh, people are buying books online and technology has even gone one step ahead. The printed books are these days available in the form of e-books. We know this, this kind of things, but th that is that is that is disruption on certain sectors like publishing industry is on the verge of collapse because of that reason. Because uh, nobody buys printed books these days. So every new technology that comes up, it has a positive aspect. It also has a negative aspects. On but but. Uh, if you weigh the positive versus negative aspect more, more uh, you will see that uh, there are more positive aspects than uh, negative aspects. And uh, if you go into high technology intensive industries, if you think about high technology industries like manufacturing a car, I lived in Japan for three years and um, I used to live in the city called Nagoya where Toyota has its uh, original and it is the largest uh, manufacturing plant of uh, Toyota is located there. Twice I've been there and I've seen uh, how Toyota is using, this was, this was 10, 11 years ago. So I've seen Toyota using artificial intelligence robots to manufacture cars. So Toyota uses robots uh, to pick up nuts and balls from uh, one belt and, and put these nuts and balls in uh, the right places mechanically, automatically, and at, at the speed of light. So these robots work faster than men. So, and, and they work uh, faster than, uh, or they, they work uh, uh, more efficient than, than people, human beings. So these robots are, uh, you know, doing their job better than men. I've seen this in Toyota factory in Japan. And, and I, ever since I had seen that, I was thinking about uh, uh, how and why and when and where we can use these robots in different other workplaces. But nowadays, these robots have come in different shapes in different fields. Like in services industries, we have chart boards. So like, you know, suppose if you go to some, you know, even simple example is vending machine. Vending machine is everywhere these days. You don't need people to make coffee and uh, tea. So coffee and chai, you can simply take it from vending machine these days. You don't need people to serve coffee and tea. Just uh, put the coin and get it from vending machine. It's everywhere, vending machine. I don't know how many vending machines are there in Calcutta, but I have seen vending machines everywhere, every country I have been and every state I've been. And uh, such kind of uh, technology at your uh, convenience, you know. So technology has replaced almost everything that uh, we have now. For example, if you book, if you serve a hotel room, you don't need to meet the receptionist these days to check in. So you can use uh, the machine in front of the reception or launch when you arrive in a hotel and you get the key cards and get the key cards and the room number, you just go there. And airline, in Europe, uh, some airlines like EasyJet and all, they pioneered the uh, self checking service. So you got to airport and you get your boarding pass printed with your booking number and straight away you go ahead for security check, such kind of things. And, and, and board the flight. So you can, you can see in all these, uh, all these uh, technological revolutions in many walks of life, in many sectors, daily basis in our life. Actually, you have, sir, rightly pointed out 
taking a clue from your things that, of course, just slightly off track, but uh, it would be our pleasure to host you, to greet you on our campus whenever you come to India or somewhere near to Kolkata. It would be our honor to greet you in our campus. Hopefully, we would leave a now normal, which is a little bit of free from COVID-19. So we are all are stuck with webinars. We desperately want seminars. Though the technology, the technology has disrupted the life of people, as you have correctly pointed out. But you see, the country like the developing country, like India, for example, where a majority part of the consumer or society is belonging to a rural India. And uh, most importantly, of course, these days, the economy is a knowledge economy and everybody is knowledgeable in the sense they may not have the degree, but they have the full information about what is going on here and there, thanks to the development in information and communication technology. But having said so, having understood from both of you, the technology has disrupted, is disrupting, and will be disrupting our future life. And it would be more and more towards the utilization purpose or to be utilized for the uh, work of the, for the day-to-day -day operations of the human being. But having said so, I'm very curious about that, that sitting at this juncture of industry 4.0 and in society 5.0, so, uh, I am asking these questions to Dr. Mukherjee, that what do you think that in the country like India, at this juncture, how we can uh, meet the goals set by UN, that the United Nations for the sustainable development. Okay, so uh, so so UN. So for the audience who. Sir, Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Okay, so for the uh, for the uh, goals that were set by UN, uh, the seventeen uh, uh, topics that uh, that UN had suggested. On poverty, I, I've I've made that list. It's right in front of me. So you yeah. have uh, poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, uh, quality education, gender equality, clean water, sanitation, affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth, industry innovation and infrastructure, reduce inequality, sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and production, climate action, life below water, life on land, peace, justice and strong institutions, and partnership for the goals. Right. So these yeah. were 17 themes that came up as a result of the UN resolution that was taken. So a uh, couple of things, Anjib, uh, is that uh, first thing is uh, as a country, we are already working towards some of them, right? And uh, we, of course, we need to balance it. We have scarcity of funds, funds are, and, and th this is the basic premises of economics. And uh, we have un un unlimited wants and uh, limited resources, right? So uh, you either invest in wars or you invest in buying bread. So you have uh, extremes on two ends. Now you make a choice as a, as a, at the end of the day, what you as a country would want to do. And uh, of course the government is uh, doing things probably not as per the list given, but if you look at the infrastructural capabilities, if you look at the uh, easy living, ease of living in uh, India or uh, in, in an Indian context, if you are looking at that, the government is slowly working towards it. For example, uh, poverty, right? Zero hunger. And the government is quoting, you will frequently re read uh, items on how the government is trying to do that. Now, Obviously, the government has been using uh, technology essentially to do that, right? So, for example, uh, in our case, uh, direct benefit transfer or DBT, which uh, which has been used in the government, for example. Uh, uh, for example, we have been uh, transferring subsidies to farmers for buying uh, seeds and uh, fertilizers, right? So, Aadhaar was Aadhaar served as a very strong uh, strong mechanism and to plug the leakages that were earlier happening in the previous system. So the other, other got attached to the banks and now the farmers at the end of every quarter or every six months, they get their money transferred. Now, if you uh, look at, or, or if you correlate this to what Abhijit Banerjee, the uh, uh, economics uh, uh, Nobel Prize winner says, that all of these have to be connected to the bigger plan, 
right? So you have a bigger goal and to this bigger goal, all of these has to be connected. And technology, if you look at them, almost all companies, IT companies today, you will see most of the IT companies are investing in all these areas. A lot, lot of these clients are coming in from the new energy sectors, for example, renewable energy sector. And a lot of investment is going on. There is a climate change debate that is that is always happening. Now, while this is good on one hand, and I and I don't disagree, right? There are certain areas wherein there is not much of work that is happening. And the work, probably the results are still not yielding results and the results are not satisfactory. For example, uh, issues like life below water, right? We really know, we really do not know whether uh, there is a tremendous impact that is happening on life below water. And as ordinary citizens, wherein uh, a significant part of my country is still struggling for two meals a day, I really am not too keen or not too bothered about what is happening in the oceans, right? So that is essentially wherein technology cannot help. It, it can bring you some kind of information. It can bring you a feel good factor, but it cannot really make a drastic or dramatic change in these areas. Yes, there are technology companies which, which are working on that, but on the overall, right? On the overall, there are certain areas, for example, poverty, zero hunger, uh, wherein uh, you, you now, if you have to go to a ration store, typically to bring your ration, you have to put in your fingerprint, pick up the ration. So that is again stopping leakages. So pre pre previously, if you had a ration card, a person who is migrating from one state to another state could not buy the ration in another state. Or they could be having duplicate set of ration cards. So somebody was picking up the ration in West Bengal, say for example, in Delhi as well. And he has a third ration card in, say for example, Maharashtra. So all of these leakages are being plugged today with the help of technology. So that is, that is definitely for us safe. Now, at the same time, I would also want to point out that there is a huge digital divide which is there not only in India but across the globe. Access to technology is a big challenge. Although we are talking about ATMs, I, I, when I flew from India to US, uh, I, I, I was working in the US for some time and uh, I carried cash and I really did not need that. Whatever money I took in the form of cash, I came back because my Amex card was sufficient to do all the transactions uh, right after the time I landed in Hong Kong, went to US and came back, everything was through my Amex card. I, I really did not need to use it. But aren't Americans using cash? They are. They are and a significant portion of them are using that. So there is always a digital divide and you will have to figure out a way in which all of these people who are not using technology to bring them into the ambit of using technology. There, there could be various reasons, right? As Professor Justin said, there are positives and negatives of technology as well. And if you look at consumer behavior, for example, which we were discussing in the previous question. Now, J Professor Justin said that there is a positive and a negative. Uh, we all agree. But the way technology is impacting different generations are completely different. For example, I had done a research on, on the usage of internet for senior citizens. Senior citizens are, are stay away from the internet, especially because, because of one simple reason that they have not, they, it's, just, it's very new to them, right? When we grow old or when you grow old, it will be easier for you to use, correct? But not for the generation who is currently, probably our parents, right? So the way technology has impacted and the way digital divide is still there, we need to go a long, long way before we can actually say that we are a fully integrated technological society. All our work is happening with the help of technology. Second, there is a lot of struggle that is happening at the back end. Let's understand this. There is struggle across the globe. There is a struggle in Africa. There is a struggle in America. There is a struggle in uh, Japan. There is a struggle in uh, Latin America. Now, if you have to divide between the haves and the have-nots, right? People who have it vis-a-vis -vis people who do not have it, right? Technology has still not invaded the people who are into the have-nots category, right? We are we are privileged people of the society, and therefore we are saying that technology has made a lot of positive impact. It has, it has to even to the rural people. If you look at Grameen Bank in Bangladesh. Right, it has massively changed. Professor Professor Eunice has made a massive change in in the way 
uh, micro lending is done in Bangladesh with the help of technology. If you see Aadhaar, is a big success story, but it is miles to go before we can actually uh, talk about it or start talking about it. EdTech companies, for example, right? The big EdTech companies, Baiju's, for example, right? I, I'm sorry to say that they're beating their drums, right? They are saying we have acquired this, we have acquired that, and they, they, are, they are, in fact, the most profitable companies, right? So they, uh, amongst the unicorns of, of, of EdTech, they are, they are absolutely profitable. But you have to still ask a question, are they really doing it to serve the masses? Are they still trying to bring it, bring the privilege of education to the masses? And second, obviously, the question goes to the businesses, would they be interested in capturing the market which is, which probably may not be very sustainable for them, wherein the people cannot afford to pay? Today, their, most of their customers are essentially in the tier one, tier two cities. Can they reach out to these rural areas? When, when most of my, when, when my son essentially moved into school, we had the privilege. Today, you have online education, but that privilege was not there for most of the students here in India, and and across the globe, they they went out of school. They are not coming back to school. Many of the schools had to be closed. So we have to take this thing into consideration before we actually talk about technology, we talk about society, right? We have to understand both the sides of the coin. It's not everything is good, neither everything is bad, right? So we are uh, trying to strike a balance between the two, right? So that is something which I, we have to keep in mind before we start taking conscious decisions, before we start making efforts in essentially how our lives would be and how we would be re reshaping ourselves, right? Thank you. you have rightly said, sir, the two things really that there are positives, there are negatives. The question lies, how do I balance? And the second thing, well, the thing is that we have miles to go uh, facing all odds, not only in terms of uh, this availability, but also in terms of this acceptability and usability. We have a lot of a lot. We have a lot of struggles to face. See, Sanjeev, I, I'll, I'll, I'll tell one point. See, if you look at academic literature, for example, and if you look at most of the consumer or consumer behavior studies that are done, they are essentially targeted from that 0 to 55 category. Very little literature. In fact, I, I, I'm, I may be wrong. Uh, Professor Justin can correct me on that. Very little, little literature is available for that group from 55 to 99 age group age in terms of demographics right i i really we really need to rethink on these lines right so i, I hope i have made my point please go ahead no Sanjay, please of course ahead. sir you have paid you have just opened up a uh, discussion in a different dimensions and you just tempted me uh, you just made me uh, curious about the things that one side we have technology 4.0 that is talking about disruptions in technology on one side we have society 5.0 that talks about utilization of technology for the betterment of the humankind or society and society means the people from rural india the people from rural part the people from urban sector the people across different ages across different demographics so with this uh, in this context I just request Professor Paul to answer this, uh, to uh, educate us on the aspect that what would be the strategy, marketing strategy, or what would be the, the activities that the corporate should do to, uh, to promote and to the, their products to different uh, people or different back demographics and to ensure better usage of their products and create awareness in the marketplace. Yeah, I, 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 I have a strong feeling that uh, managers or corporates, they need a hybrid strategy because uh, uh, what I mean by hybrid strategy is it's kind of mixed strategy. So people, those who are seniors or those who are above 50, they are using technology, but they are not big fans of technology. So 
there is a kind of segmentation requirement for managers, those who want to target people, those who are 50, and those who, because they were not born with all these technologies. They got access to this technology or internet only after they turn 20 or 25. So they, 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 they are not, since they are not born with the technology, they need to be treated in as, as a different cohort, as a different segment. But those who are born with this technology, like internet, and those who are born after 1997, or those who are born after 1995, uh, or even those who are born after 1990, so they can be treated with a different strategy or different kind of target or segmentations. Uh, they, they, because they know they, they love, and they, they use technology much more often and frequent than the senior generation. So uh, I, I would say that way that, uh, you know, I mean, th there is no need for segmenting with uh, uh, five or four targets or segments, but uh, at least two segments will work and that kind of segmentation is required as far as corporates are concerned. And I mean, for example, uh, still corporates need to think about brick and mortar strategy or offline transaction for seniors because they will still believe that shopping as an experience, especially after 55 or after 50, they will still love to go to the shops to feel that, to feel good. So because they will not prefer to stay home and do everything from home. So they will still prefer to go out and experience the shopping as an experience. So they, they need to be treated with uh, offline. Uh, offline is not that, that's what I mean to say. It's not all about online. So offline is also important. So companies need a hybrid strategy offline strategy as well as online strategy, online strategy targeting the young consumers. I mean, young consumers, what I mean, those who are, I, I, don't, I don't want to define young consumers with an age group of 25 or anything like that, but uh, anybody who has uh, born with uh, technology and uh, the old consumers, uh, people, those who were born before uh, 1990 or before 1985 or, or some kind of segmentation that can segmentation maybe maybe helpful in in uh, treating the customers or attracting the customers in in different ways i think that that will work thank you sir and we have correctly uh, classified the consumers as that the, the customer who are belonging to before 1990 to them, the shopping is an experience. Really, of course, and the customer who are, uh, who uh, just came, uh, I mean, born after 1990, to them, technology is an experience. So in my, in my home also, I can feel, because the way my brother uses the technology, he born in 1990, and the way I am utilizing the technology, I born in 19, 1981, there is a difference. There's a demarcated difference. You have correctly classified these things. Now, question is, this demarcation is basically uh, what I feel with my experience that the demarcation is basically based on the acceptability of the technology, the awareness, the kind of uh, experience, the kind of knowledge I have about this technology. That is actually exactly the demarcating factor for me at least. Though I am a strong believer that Till you die, you have to learn an art. I'm a strong believer of this fact, but still this, uh, this point is, is just uh, tempting me to ask the questions to Dr. Mukherjee uh, once again, since you belong to learning, uh, learning part or the development of human capabilities part, you are leading this, you are uh, leading and one of the eminent corporate in India, in this segment. So my question is that, that today we all are talking about artificial intelligence, right? You talk about EdTech. Of course, that has revolutionized the entire landscape of education management. And I can remember that uh, this year's union budget, the minister, the honorable minister has said to set up for digital university. And this recent COVID-19 has also uh, just acted like a catalyst to go more and more online. But still I'm asking this question that, do you believe that artificial intelligence can enhance or expand the human capabilities and address the social challenges 
to the extent what is being projected okay so sanjeev uh, uh, two premature question to ask about artificial intelligence and whether uh, it will uh, uh, it will impact the society the answer to that question is i don't know right and uh, let me be very honest i i don't know right i i do not know what is going to happen in future uh, but uh, yes it has shown some kind of uh, some kind of uh, positives in the market uh, if you look at a technology like robo advisory right which is a kind of artificial intelligence wherein i had i have one of my research papers on it Uh, it's it's still in the way of writing it right so uh, application of ai uh, now if you look at these areas these ais are still being configured or made by human beings so there is some kind of human brain that is essentially still configuring the ai now how it is put into use how it is deployed in the market how do people use them how do companies use them is a long long way to go we we are we are businesses have started already using you will see application of it in uh, industry sectors across industry sectors but uh, what is the future where the future lies or is it just a fad uh, probably not a fad i i personally my perspective is that it is not a fad it is it is still going it is still going to stay for quite some time Uh, but uh, the thing is that or is it a new wine in a old bottle or a old wine in a new bottle kind of so whatever it might be so it's very difficult to predict as of today right uh, a lot of companies are investing money we really do not know whether they are wasting their money on investments on artificial intelligence or they are gaining some uh, good benefits at least they are telling us that yes we are making uh, we are benefiting from the applications of the artificial intelligence but uh but we are we are still i think in the introductory phase of ai we are still not moved up uh, the uh, the escape velocity that is essentially needed to put the rocket into a orbit has still not come into artificial intelligence we are way way uh, uh, miles to go essentially even for artificial intelligence right uh, it has still not come into the ambit of a common man right we are still not able to see the benefits of ai correct businesses probably might have they would have used it some somewhere they are using it they are using it in fact i can vouch for sure right lot of people are getting hired into the ai space but uh, way to go way to go it's it's too early to say sanjeev this is my perspective right Uh, you have correctly quite interestingly you have mentioned that the escape velocity that is required to put a rocket in the orbit that has not been reached and we are still a miles to go now it is a very interesting discussion that is going on and personally i am feeling very much uh, honored and privileged to learn these things and i would have loved to continue these sessions but i am also keeping the time frame in mind keeping in mind that your business uh, you and at the same time professor paul is not feeling that okay right now so i am not i don't don't want to extend the session for uh, another one hour or so but i if i wish i could i could but before we go for this question and answer session my one last query to both of you that we uh, i belong to an institute calcutta business school uh, which is a part of 100 years old sikshatan uh, foundation and there we provide kg to pg that means from the pre kg to post graduate i belong to the post graduate unit and we all teach now this is a kind of area where we have different strata of students are learning now my questions to both of you that for the upcoming for the new students or the graduating students or those who are learning now and they will soon join to the corporate or uh, in later years what would be your advice to them how do they uh, withstand this kind of change and how do they act like a enabler of this kind of change to happen so i first ask professor paul yeah so it's a important question so i would say that uh, um they need to 
they need to take things more sincerely and seriously in terms of updating their knowledge and information those kind of things because uh, the uh, job market and uh, profession is these days very competitive and uh, it's, uh, it's a competitive world. Competition is intensifying. So uh, I would say that suppose in case, uh, if you are a very smart boy or smart girl, you might get your first job, but to survive and succeed in your job and to climb up the ladders, you need uh, knowledge. You, you cannot um, sustain and you cannot perform better without knowledge. So knowledge is very important. Smartness alone will not work to transcend horizon in your life. So that requires knowledge. Knowledge, in other words, I can also say information and knowledge. So you have to be knowledgeable. You have to be competent. Your competence is very important. And uh, knowledge is the first step towards competence. And uh, also consider survival and success as part of the same coin, two sides of the same coin. So survival is on the other side and success is on the other side. You might be able to survive if you're smart, but you may not be able to succeed in long run. Some people succeed in short run uh, with the smartness, but um, the, the, that success uh, doesn't last forever. Suppose if you want to succeed in long run, you need knowledge, you need, uh, you need to be competent and uh, always uh, try to work hard to achieve that knowledge and uh, competency. And you have to be globally competent, not nationally competent. That global competency is also very important. And always think about uh, how do I groom myself as a globally competent, knowledgeable candidate? That works. And you need that kind of thought process. And success is a journey and never put a full stop on your way to succeed. Thank you, sir, uh, for your advice. And uh, really, is it knowledge, competency, and competency means global competency. And quite <clears throat> correctly, sir, you have said that success and survival, the two A's are on the two different sides of the same coin. Now, I ask the same questions to take the views of Dr. Mukherjee, what is what would be your advice to the students? Okay, so first of all, uh, please try and understand that uh, even if you have done a specialization in marketing or finance or HR, Sorry, two minutes. yeah, yeah. So even if you have done a specialization in marketing, finance or HR, does not matter. Uh, these are cross-functional. The way what has been taught to you in college, keep them back in college, keep the degree back at your home, and start working in the industry. Right, so the way consumers work, the way real time market works is completely different from the way it is taught in academics. Right, it is absolutely, absolutely dramatically different. Consumers could be very predictable at times, very unpredictable at times. You just do not know, no book fits into them. Right, it's real time, everything is happening real time around you, things are changing around you in real time. So, so keep that away. So, that's the first thing that I would want to tell you. Second is, world is flat, right. The, the Panwala sitting next to your house is essentially getting a competition not only from China, but he's getting competition from US as well. And so you are, right? So even if you do not upgrade yourself and uh, create your own versions, version two, version three, version four of yourself, you will become redundant in a couple of years. Say, for example, you start your career in sales and you work for five years. After that, what do you do? You have a family, work for another five more years, 10 years, and then you are out of job. Because by the time you are 35, you cannot possibly, you do not want to carry in sales or until, so, so or, or probably you will be having, facing difficulties in sales because the top level is saturated. You have to jump from one company to another company. You are essentially becoming, you are doing a lateral jump, correct? So the effective way to reduce this impact is essentially in upscaling yourself. So figure out and find out ways through which you can hedge yourself against this uncertainty. So this is one single piece of advice that I would want to give you. Of right. course. Third thing, yeah, Sanjeev sir, a couple of yes, one, yes. One thing. The third thing that I would want to always tell you is that keep adding value in the lives of other people, right? So always keep adding wherever you find a chance. Keep adding and 
adding value in the lives of other people in a meaningful way, not in a negative way. Do good, right? And it is definitely going to hit you back in some time or the other. I've, I've, I, I started off my career in sales today just because I'm an, I, I, I shifted multiple industries. I started off my career in sales with a Tata company. Then I went to into a bank. Then I came into an educational institution. Then I'm in, in, in IT and in IT, I've played multiple roles, pre-sales, sales, uh, uh, customer facing roles. And now I'm into training and development. Correct. And what did I do my graduation in? I had a post graduation in, I had done it in marketing and finance. It has absolutely no connection with what I am doing now. It will have absolutely no connection with what I, when I'm going to retire. So just because you are a marketing guy or just because you are a sales guy, right? Doesn't mean that you are not supposed to tread into the areas of others. Please get that out of your head, right? It is, it is not compartmentalized. As a student, as a individual in this society, you are not supposed to compartmentalize yourself, right? You are not supposed to be in that prison hall, right? If you have watched that movie, Shawshank Redemption, Morgan Freeman, you are not supposed to stay in that prison cell forever. Just because you are in sales doesn't mean that you will have to live in sales till 60. You can make a change. You can do it provided you find out different avatars of yourself. Version two, version three. You have to, you have to figure out and think long-term, right? So as Professor Justin said, you might be successful in short term, fail in long term, be a marathon runner. That's a, that's the best thing. Fantastic. Be a marathon runner. You have to run long. It's a, it's a long, long life, right? So ensure that you are not taking sprints. You are not becoming Usain Bolts. I don't want Bolts. I want marathon runners. Life is like a marathon. It's not a sprint. Please get that out of your head. So be very careful. Technology is pervasive. Even if you're a marketing or a sales guy and technology has not been taught to you, learn technology and see if you can upgrade yourself and move into higher and higher roles. Otherwise, you will be jumping from one company to another company with a higher package. That is not going to add value to you in the long run. See where the demand is. It's, it's all going to be gig. Five years you work, contract, contract gets over and you are done. Most of the government jobs in senior positions today are taken by contracts. Right? So these are the changes that are going to happen and get ready for that. Today, a couple of weeks back, you saw a company called as better.com laid off thousands of people on one night. They were highly paid and suddenly one night you have a con call, conference call. If you are unlucky to be in this call, you are out of this company. Three months salary and you are done. What do you do? Have you upgraded yourself? Do you have emergency fund to sustain? So these are some of the questions that will come up. These are risks. Be aware of these risks and start hedging yourself against them. Right? Thanks, thanks, Anjeev, sir. I will not take much time. Yeah. So you have said, uh, I mean, it is very, uh, it is a matter of uh, great learning for us to listen to you, uh, you two experts. And quite correctly, you said that three things that I can say, get out of your compartment, be flexible to every function, hedge yourself through continuous upgradation of yourself. And one of the very, very pertinent, very interesting and very valuable advice that you have given that talks about be and let. You stand on your capability, you develop yourself and you add value to others' life. So this is an ultimate objective of, I guess, for any technological development, for the self and mutual development of the others and adding value to the others' life to make this society uh, very livable. I mean, everybody can live in this society and can develop at the same time. So it is now my turn to go for the brief question answer session. Before I go, I would request our IT team to just show our uh, very small video about our campus uh, to uh, the viewers and particularly Professor Mukherjee and Paul, Professor Paul. And we would love to give them on our campus, but for the time being, please run this video, very small video of our campus. Excelling is your essence. 
then you are welcome to Calcutta Business School. Center of Excellence. Centered on Excellence. It all started in the year 1920 when some eminent industrialists of Kolkata founded the Marwari Balika Vidyalaya. Later, in 1954, Sri Shikshatan School was founded and in 1955, Sri Shikshatan College came into being with the objective of further propagating quality education to girls. All these institutions have continued to excel under the management of the Shikshatan Foundation. It has been guided by industrialists like President Mr. S.K. Birla, Director Emeritus, Birla Brothers Private Limited, Mr. Siddharth Birla, Vice President. Mr. G.K. Khetan, Trustee and President of Shikshatan College, Mr. Aris Goinka, Trustee and MD of Imami Group, and many other reputed industrialists. The Secretary General of the Foundation is Mrs. Brothuti Bhattacharya. Greetings. I would like to speak a few words about our institution, the Shikshatan Foundation. The year was 1920 when some of my forefathers uh, thought that female education needed to be propagated much more actively than was the custom in those days. And we donated from our family two buildings in the heart of Bada Bazaar uh, for, the girl, for the girl's child to be educated there. That institution is still working. The latest addition to our bouquet of institutions has been the Calcutta Business School, which was started a few years ago uh, on a 15-acre plot of land in, uh, not very far away from IIM Calcutta. Calcutta Business School offers an AICTE-approved, autonomous, two-year full-time residential program on postgraduate diploma in management majoring in subjects like finance, marketing, IT, operations and human resource. But it's the unique cluster of courses that sets it apart. Interactive and intuitive games like management game and stock market simulation game. It also puts heavy emphasis on data handling and business analytics and uses databases and software like CMIE Prowess, MetaStock, R and SAP. Kolkata is the city of joy. It is the cultural capital of India, a city which has its soulful embodiment of culture, love, mystery, respect and enthusiasm. A city that upholds a perfect juxtaposition between the old world and the modern one. It has given us many Nobel laureates over the years. It has iconic institutes like the Calcutta University, the National Library, Presidency University, Bisho Bharati, IIM Calcutta and many such legendary institutes. Calcutta Business School's AICTE-approved PGDM program is carrying forward this rich legacy of Kolkata. Thank you. I, I would ask, uh, request the participants or uh, our team that if you have any questions from the viewers or participants directly who are here, that you might you want to ask to our experts you can type here in the chat box i can ask these uh, questions to them you can also ask if you have any questions you can also ask later on which i will forward to the uh, panelists for taking their views also so we will just wait for uh, three four minutes to get these questions if you have any questions here If you have any questions, please type this question in the chat box. And I also request our team, if they have any questions written on the Facebook page, please supply this question in the chat box.
So anyway, so uh, but till such time questions are arrived, I am very happy to welcome Dr. Pinaki Ranjan Bhattacharya. He is the principal acting of Calcutta Business School, and also he is the senior professor from the area of marketing. So, Professor Bhattacharya, I request Professor Bhattacharya to say a few words uh, about the today's panel discussion. And meanwhile, I request uh, all the participants or viewers to write questions in the chat box. Professor Bhattacharya. Uh, thank you, Sanjeev. Uh, good evening to all the participants, Professor Paul and Dr. Mukherjee. Am I audible to all of you? Yes, you're audible, sir. Yeah, in fact, you know, <laughs> I mean, uh, since I have I just reached home, I'm not in a position to open my camera. Okay, uh, I'm sorry for that. And I've heard the entire session, what Professor Paul and Dr. Mukherjee has deliberated to the in different areas from industry 4.0 to society 5.0. And I, I fully agree with Professor Paul what, what he said, that, you know, uh, because we are above 50, many of us, I think Dr. Mukherjee is also above 50. So the, which, which really, I really like that particular point. What he said is that, you know, there's a difference in the mindset of the people because Gen Z, as we call it, as he rightly said, born after 1995 or during that time, they have a different mindset altogether because they have been exposed to the internet or this ICT, as we call it, more often than what we have been. Because we have, we have passed an era where we have seen the advent of gramophone. We have also seen the advent of IT to some extent, what's the Lotus, etc. And then today, we see AI. Of course, many of us are not very much familiar or we are not using these tools most of the time or many a times. But again, when we use it, we find that, yes, so many things we have to know from these tools. I really feel this is from my particular uh, area or my in marketing. You know, when, a, when a marketer or a person goes to the market to sell a product, he normally goes to the market. And even today, as Professor Paul rightly said, that people do explore offline shopping more than online shopping. Of course, COVID has brought us to a situation where we had to go for mm -hmm. online shopping to a certain extent. But even to now today, with COVID receding across the country and across the globe, I feel I've seen people moving out of their houses to go for you know shopping offline because they feel they can feel the particular product. It's not a service, it's a product because product and service, as we know, have got a very distinctive feature that is tangibility, and which is very, very important in today's world, in today's aspect. I think in this context, Industry 4.0 probably has taken some turn, but it is still yet to reach that level where Society 5.0 can accept it. I think, am I right, Dr. Mukherjee or Professor Paul? Am I right? Yes. Sir. yes. Yeah, you're, you're, you're not audible fully. Yes, yes, Prof, sir. I think yeah. that is, I mean, I'm sorry because, you know, I cannot open my camera, of course, you know. No, no, no worries, no worries, sir. No worries. Because my, uh, it's not, uh, I'm sorry for that. But, you know, I think this is what we have seen. You know, you know even you know, when you're in Kolkata or in Bangalore or in Delhi, particularly in the Indian metros, when you go to those places, you will see the people who are there, they move, move around in the market more. Because even today, if you go to a shop, to purchase vegetable, they, they first touch it, fill it, and then they go for the product, right? It's not that every time they go for a licious or mish or I mean, I mean, or, you know, this uh, big basket or blanket or of, of, of those types in India, particularly I'm talking of, or in Kolkata as we call it, right? Even in Bangalore also, particularly. And you know, Uber and Uber was a disruptive innovation probably, which I have felt. But again, Uber is slowly losing its ground to other other local players. Because Uber has got some, yes, uh, two, two days back, I was reading a, an article wherein they have appointed people to find out the problems what Uber passengers are finding in India. They have uh, formed a council. That means that they are taking, they have got this problem uh, rightly pointed and are trying to take some corrective action if possible. Again, am I right? Am I talking in the right sense? Professor Paul, are you there? Professor Paul, uh, he is disconnected, okay. but nevertheless, it is being recorded and uh, uh, being live streamed. So okay. perhaps he can he say listen to. 
Yeah, Dr. Mukherjee, am I right? What I'm saying? Yes, yes, yes Prof. Sir. I'm, I'm listening to you. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. It was so, nice, you know, it was nice talking to you and meeting you all over I mean, you know, virtual world because we, as we are left out today, you know, but, you know, hopefully we feel that you'll be coming to a campus once you come to Kolkata, both Professor Paul and you. I invite both of you on behalf of Calcutta Business School. I am already in Kolkata, sir. Okay, well, you are in Kolkata, so why, I would request you to come down to Kaima campus one day sure. and we can have a discussion, you know, offline discussion as you call it, right? physical, physical in sure, sure. discussion. Absolutely, absolutely. I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll be happy to meet, meet you and talk to you about this. Okay, absolutely. we can have a discussion at length. And in fact, you might be knowing one of my scholars, Sunetra. She was talking about you, you, you to me a few days back. I think she is in touch with you. So okay. she was talking to me that well, I spoke to sir and sir was talking about something. So I said, okay, fine, I'll talk, I'll have a meeting with him. We will discuss issues. Sure, sure, sir. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm thankful to Sanjeev. Sanjeev, once again, please, I'm there. I thank you, thank, thank all of you for your, thank for you, your thank you. participation here. Thank, thank you. you. So it is now, uh, every good thing has to have an end. So it is my turn to request my student, Koshiki Mojumdar, to just briefly say a vote of thanks and the key takeaways from this session. Very briefly, Koshiki. A uh, very good evening to everyone present here. Uh, the webinar was truly an insightful one. Thank you, sir, for throwing light on such an important topic. We truly got to learn a lot from you. Now, I, Koshiki Masuda from Batch 2021 till 2023, would like to present the key takeaways from today's session. Uh, as explained by uh, Dr. Justin Paul, sir, that uh, changes in business management coming years is uh, like use of the mobile application. So uh, here we explain that uh, just like in pandemic, restaurants were closed. But uh, what they did, like uh, as restaurants were closed, so no pickup, no pickup or dining options were available. So they have launched mobile application for food delivery. Uh, next is use of technology. Uh, big data analytics has become an important tool for all business functions. Technology has revolutionized our world and daily lives. Companies are investing large funds in technology as it's growing faster. It has created amazing tools and resources. Like uh, this is, I think, yes, uh, it is explained by uh, Dr. Kori Shankar Mukherjee, sir, that uh, driverless cars, metros in cities, and subways in cities. So these are the uses of technology, uh, which has uh, a change in business management. Uh, next up is self-service technology. Self-service technology includes an ATM. ATM uh, is a self-service technology uh, that has an advantage of like serving more customers as well as improving uh, the customer satisfaction. Apart from that, technology has negative as well as positive effects. Like overuse of social media and mobile devices could, uh, could, lack of, uh, could lead to lack of sleep. Uh, if I talk about the positive aspect, uh, just like um, it has, uh, nowadays we use online transaction. We don't have to uh, go to the retailer shop to buy anything. So we can directly pay the uh, retailer or pay to the shop uh, by transacting online using many options like phone pay, Google pay, PTM or mobile banking. Uh, like uh, robots are doing nowadays better job than men. In service industries, we have chatbots to solve our problems. So uh, next up is the government of India is working towards the SGDS. So there is a, uh, the 17 goals that were taken by United Nations and as a country, India is working towards it. Government is working and is trying to look into poverty like direct benefit transfer has been implemented to benefit them. There is a digital divide, uh, uh, divide across the world. It describes the global uh, yeah, it describes the global uh, disparities between developed and uh, developing countries in regards to access to computing and uh, resources. Lastly, we learn 
to get out of our comfort and comfort zone and should upgrade with the upcoming technology, uh, upcoming technology. So uh, if we uh, get out of our comfort zone and uh, to let, uh, like if we get out of our comfort zone and if we upgrade ourselves uh, with the upcoming technology, so it has to be, uh, it has to be like students should stand on their capability and add value to others' life. So uh, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Oshiki, uh, yes. for summarizing the session. As a moderator of the session, it was really my pleasure and honor to share this session with two experts who have talked elaborately the impact of technology on the society and the way forward. From my bottom of my hand, uh, bottom of my heart, I express my sincere thanks and gratitude to both the speakers of this session on Industry 4.0 and Society 5.0. As we said that it would be our uh, privilege to greet you on our campus and Professor Mukher, Dr. Mukherjee that uh, Aparajita knows you, Aparajita is in touch with you. So uh, we, we will suddenly fix up certain time to uh, greet you on our campus at Vishnupur. And Professor Paul, he is not there. So for him also, our sincere regards and our invitation, whenever he comes to Kolkata or West Bengal or India, nearby places, it would be our fortune to greet him on our campus. So with this, I formally would like to close this session. Thank you all the participants. Thank you our professors, colleagues, students, and also of course our top management for motivating us to organize this kind of sessions. We would come up with different kind of sessions in future. So hopefully we would also meet you once again in virtual mode. Thank you so much.